Hey everybody, Second Engineer here. It's been a little while, but a lot of changes coming up and a lot of good things coming, so uh, hopefully it's worth it and I hope you enjoy. Anyway, this is part two of setting up the checkpoint firewall. Uh, this time I'm actually gonna be going into the GUI and start doing the initial setup. I haven't really gone through the GUI before because I wanna get a feel for how intuitive the platform actually is. So let's get into it. All right, let's see. All right, first time configuration. I did run through this wizard once, but just the wizard. All right, so let me set this one up real quick. Something extremely strong like 135.6. Okay, you can enable complexity. Nice. Time and setup. Uh, of course, NTP is going to be preferable whenever you get a chance, so I'm going to go with that. Appliance name. Sec. Checkpoint. Local management. Oh, I use central management for most firewalls. Now, DHCP is going to be the standard for most home connections or small businesses. If you have a static internet connection, we can set that for later. But in this case, since it's going to be the most common for this size of firewall, which is ideal for SMB, I'm going to go with DHCP. Now I have this in a lab environment, so it's not actually going to get a public IP, it's going to be getting a private IP. So it's gonna be getting something within my LAN. Now, since this is in a lab environment, I don't have the WAN setup connected right now. It's not necessary for us to go through a lot of the config, but I do kind of want to put it on a SIF report with my firewall so I can see what it catches and mine's not. So I'll leave this on DHCP for now and I will set that up later. Okay, LAN ports are just what we're connected to. Now keep in mind, if you change the LAN address here, it's going to disconnect you from the web interface because we're currently connected to that. Right now I'm connected to 192.168.1.1. So if I change that, naturally I get disconnected from it. Okay, now in this case, I already have DHCP server running my network, so I actually don't want a second one. I'm going to disable this. Oh, uh, yes, if you do change your LAN address, whatever you change that address to will be your new gateway. So you'll have to enter that IP in your browsers to get to it afterward. All right, and Wi Fi. Now, I want to use this Wi Fi to test out some of my IoT devices back here. So I will enable this. But since it is for IoT devices, I actually do only need the 2.4 gigahertz. So let's go with test IoT. There we go. Now, let me go back real quick. Kind of interesting is how we select between the two instead of one. Does it? So I'm used to most APs that I use doing band steering. So you don't have to configure the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz network. But let's see what that actually ends up looking like in the interface. Okay. So in this one, this is going to be what interfaces you can access the web GUI from. Uh, it's just saying that if you're connected on the LAN ports, you can access the management GUI. If you're on the wireless and authenticated, you can access it. And if you're on VPN, which of course would require authentication, you can also access a management GUI. This one, internet. In my opinion, you should never allow for management access via the internet port, via your WAN port. Uh, what that does, it makes it to where you can get to the web GUI, to the configuration page, the management page from the internet. So uh, whatever your public IP is, you, you type that public IP in any browser and you can access the web GUI. Yes, you require a username and password, but you're assuming there's not going to be any kind of vulnerability for the login. And you're assuming that no one's going to be able to brute force it. Now, I know there is timeouts and stuff like that, but but yes, there is timeouts and lockouts, but there is plenty of ways to get around that. Okay, and then you can set up a trusted network or addresses. So that's just saying only this IP or only IPs from this network can access the web GUI. So you can further limit who can connect to the management portal. In this case, again, home environment, I'm gonna leave this as is. So I guess, for example, here I'm going to get, this is a pretty cool feature. Usually uh, you just put in the address itself, but again, to try and make it as simple as possible for anybody to do it, be like, oh, well, this is my computer. I'm always gonna access it from here put get IP from my computer and there you go. That's the IP that I'm using on this lab. And I only want my computer to be able to access the management portal. So that's pretty nice. All right. Actually, can you add a network? Yeah, you can. All right. You have multiple networks and multiple VLANs. Uh, you have a management VLAN. You can just put the, there we go. That. So if you have multiple networks and one of them is assigned the management VLAN, you can put in the network information for the management VLAN here making it so only that network can access the management portal. That's actually something I set up and recommend on pretty much any piece of equipment that I set up. If it's possible to restrict which workstations, which IPs can even access the management portal, please do it. I had to skip the last one because there was a key in there. And wow, this is a lot of stuff to activate. I'm actually going to start with not all of them. I want to see what the throughput is going to be with just the bare minimum and then how much each one of these is going to reduce the throughput of our firewall. But we'll be doing that in another video. So I consider this a bare minimum because next gen firewalls should be able to do layer seven and IPS again, should be something that is always active on a firewall. Uh, there's really not much of a reason to not use one. 
And yes, all these do add a performance hit to your throughput, but that's kind of the way it works. It doesn't matter what firewall, what you're using, the more processes I have to do with each packet, of course, the slower it's going to be for throughput. But how much it reduces varies a lot between each vendor because of how they handle things and what equipment they have on hand and what equipment or hardware is built into it. But yes, bare minimum, firewall, application, and IPS, intrusion prevention. And so far, I like the setup. It had some of the features that I, I expect and would want to set up in a firewall for SMB or even enterprise. Enterprise, and it's already advanced for anything you would have at home for sure. Uh, on top of that, it doesn't just come with a default. It's letting you build your default, if that makes sense. First impressions on the GUI, um, definitely better than some other ones I've been working with. Okay, internet access, wireless. This is one thing I was curious about. Do we have band steering? Is it using both radios? Okay, by default, wireless is going to be on its own network separate from the LAN, which makes sense. And I would agree, most of the time your wireless network should be a separate VLAN or separate network. Okay, it's running DHCP, of course. Go advance. High density, we don't need that. Uh, filter MAC addresses. So this is one of the things I was looking for. In Traditionally, in most firewalls, you have to create a rule to let one network talk to another. It will deny by default. But for the sake of simplicity here, it does by default allow access to this wireless network from the local network. So in other words, there's already an implicit rule that to allow from wireless to all your LAN networks. And while that's not what I might want all the time, that is what most people will want. And again, it's made for simplicity. This, I would definitely turn on log traffic from this network to local traffic. I want to know, and I think it's just important for anyone to record it, where anytime anything from your wireless network is gonna to talk to anything from your, to your local network. It's not always typical. If you have IoT devices in your network, even then it's not always needed because your IoT stuff should not be initiating sessions. But again, that all depends on how you have it separated. It does look that like the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz radio are separate networks on this one. I'm not the biggest fan of that. That's that's what makes it to where you have two different Wi-Fi's come up on your page, the 2 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz versus just one. I am personally a fan of band steering where the access point will automatically route between the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz depending on what your signal is. Yeah, I poked around just a little bit to see if there's any obvious way to turn on band steering, but it doesn't seem to be available here. Virtual access point, nice. VLANs, all right. From the networking or interface and everything looks as expected here for me. We have all the features I would uh, want to have in any network. So it does have basically a guest hotspot or guest portal built into it. Again, ideal for SMB. So let's see. Uh, first, we need to create an interface for that, uh, which I would assume we have to make a virtual access point. All right, let's name this guest Wi-Fi. Use hotspot when connecting to network. How do they define hotspot? Okay, so there's the built-in capture portal as well. I guess this is gonna depend on the size of your building or your business. 2.4 is gonna give you greater range, but not as good speed, because I mean, if I'm doing a guest Wi-Fi, I'd probably just set up that one. Or you can set up the five and two, but you know, now protect the network. If it's a guest Wi-Fi, I can keep it open. I don't mind. I'm assuming we're gonna have protection set up here to segregate the, to separate the network. Yes, and the default is to separate the network. Perfect, okay, this is what I was looking for. So even though the built-in one that we did in the wizard, the default was to allow access to LAN network, this hotspot one is not the default and you don't want that. Yeah, if it's a guest Wi-Fi, you definitely don't want that traffic to be able to touch your LAN network. And it looks like everything, everything else by default is good to go. The rest is automated, great. So now we have guest Wi-Fi set up, even more stuff to make it simple. If you don't have much experience with networking, I actually really like that it is creating the networks for us. It's choosing the IPs. So the new guest Wi-Fi is 192.168.200.1, a slash 24. And again, if you don't know what that means, that's exactly why they do it this way. So you don't have to worry about it. They're gonna create the networks for you and the access policies default so far have been on point. Oh, well, looks like that one wasn't configured for hotspot after all. Might've missed that. There we go. So that one is now considered a hotspot. There we go. One network interface is defined for hotspot. I don't want authentication, but check it out. You can make your own hotspot portal. Okay, you can use a redirect if you have your own. You can upload your logo. I'm gonna upload one. Particles. And I'll, I'll use my YouTube banner. Sure, that's fine. That's not the one I wanted to use, but that'll work. All right, apply. 
routing. We got our default routes for each one auto generated. Perfect. Good. Uh, I just want to see what it looks like when I'm setting it up. Okay. You don't have to create objects, but they are available. Okay. So it's not object based. A fan of Mac filtering. It's not really a ideal for a lot of environments, but I mean, it's still nice to have. Okay. Can I change my, yes, obviously and easy to change. Uh, I would recommend for most anybody that can uh, change your DNS from the one your ISP gives you to a more secure one like OpenDNS or, or Cloudflare or, or Quad9. But again, this isn't a lab, so I'm not gonna change that right now. All right, not gonna do administrative access right now or search. All right, so everything's good there. Let's look at our access policy. By default, there's a default rule that allows all traffic out to the internet, which is pretty standard practice. And again, SMB space, uh, that's probably exactly what you're gonna end up with. Even if you get a firewall that's not geared towards SMB. Allow traffic between internal networks and trusted networks. Okay, so strict mode would be what you would get traditionally on a firewall where you're building everything yourself, where you just have a default denied and you have to build all your allowed policies from there. So adding a server usually ends up being pretty involved on any firewall because that's where you have to create access policies from the outside to the inside and your NAT rules, NAT translation rules, and assign the ports, which people, uh, which is also known as port forwarding, especially then if it's object-based and you have to create objects for it. It can get complicated real quick, especially for someone that isn't a security engineer, right? A wizard to add a server is pretty sweet, actually. Web server will use the web the ports by default. So Minecraft has a default port. Minecraft default. If you're using the default port for a Minecraft server, if you don't change it, it's going to be 255.65. So that's the only port we're going to allow. And it has to be both TCP and UDP. Luckily, it gives us the options without having to do two entries. Yeah, that's the thing. Minecrafts. And the Minecraft server in my network is 1.2.1.1.100. I am loving these wizards more and more. So it's adding a DNS entry. It's adding a DHCP ex exclusion. And it can add a DHCP reservation as well if I have the MAC address. So again, these are all steps that we should take, but we usually end up having to do ourselves one by one if you remember them. <laughs> or steps that you would end up doing. One person does it on the firewall. One person's going to do it on uh, your DC. So it's just, again, everything's built to just work simply and without doing the minimum amount of manual configuration. So since this is going to be a Minecraft server that you want your friends to be able to access or other people to be able to access from the internet, you're gonna have to trust all traffic because you don't know what IPs are gonna be coming from. If you do, well then yeah, you can manually configure it and put the IPs of those people that are gonna connect to you, but that's not usually the case. Now, if it's a server that's only gonna be accessed from within your organization, they have a default for that as well. Ah, okay, now NAT, this is what I mentioned earlier. So if it's gonna be available to the internet, you're gonna need to enable NAT. In this case, it's gonna be hide behind gateway, which again, most people know as port forwarding. There we go. Okay, so uh, let me go home. Wow, so what I thought was gonna take a couple different videos, we got to just completely do in one take with no prep. I've done my initial setup. Oh wait, no, let's look at the, okay, let's look at, all right, so besides our firewall policy, which will go with standard application URL filtering, this is gonna be our layer seven rules where it's going to be able to block apps, not just web traffic, any internet traffic. It has application signatures, so it can recognize what's TikTok, what's WhatsApp, and what's whatever application you're using. Uh, block security risk categories, we'll have to look into which ones that they list but now i'm thinking i should do this part in another feature so we can go deeper into each one so for now i'm going to leave this in default we'll go into this in another video by default it's only going to be logging the block traffic so that'll be the traffic that's either a policy violation or one that's going to be setting off an intrusion prevention rule an ips rule or of course setting off whatever other security stuff we have in place that is a great place to start but myself and most of my clients want to see all the traffic they want to be able to go and check if someone was doing something they weren't supposed to or if there is any workstation or server or anything that's going to websites that shouldn't. So not just the ones that are technically security concerns because there are stuff that could be allowed that are still security concerns. So I would prefer to log all traffic. Keep in mind though, again, that's gonna be lots of logs. So make sure that you put a pretty hefty SD card in it, which that alone, honestly, I love. I usually have to buy different models of firewalls to have onboard memory. So it's pretty refreshing to see one that is so user-friendly, you can just put in an SD card and add the amount of space you need. So now we have our active policy for the, for the server. Let's go over to threat protection and see what we got for IPS, for our intrusion prevention. This looks like a lot, cause it is. But majority of the time, we are going to leave either default or tune as we go. And by tuning, I mean allowing or disabling rules uh, that are setting off false positives. In other words, if you notice stuff is getting blocked that shouldn't get be getting blocked, uh, that's when we might have to tune it. But most of the time, that's not really necessary when it comes to the IPS rule. Hey, bypass under load, that's a fail through. That's in case the firewall is receiving too much traffic and it can't keep up with inspecting, it'll just allow the stuff through versus dropping it. Antivirus, I haven't enabled antivirus, huh? 
interesting. Okay, a important thing to note with any firewall, uh, we are limited on what protocols we can scan if they are encrypted or not. So notice here, it's, it should say to scan HTTPS. I'm not sure what this is HTTP. Yeah, see, that's what they meant. Okay, now for the protocols we can scan, and take note, this is gonna be true of any firewall. We're limited on what traffic we can inspect depending if it's encrypted or not. Right here, we can get to our options for SSL traffic inspection. Uh, it does say to scan HTTP, it should say HTTPS, because and there's HTTP categorization or SSL traffic inspection. Big difference between the two. HTTPS categorization just means is this certificate the certificate that belongs to the site you're trying to go to, and whatever other metadata is going to be in that certificate. So you're not going to be actually looking at the traffic since that will still be encrypted. SSL traffic inspection is where you're actually going to be replacing the certificate with your own, so we can decrypt the traffic in the firewall. That gets a lot more complicated and honestly something that is already hard to do in an enterprise environment, let alone in the SMB space. So HTTP categorization, perfectly fine. That is the default in most every uh, firewall that I work with, unless we actually have the stuff to do SSL decryption. All right, so let's check out the, the threat prevention or the IPS rules are set. I wanna see what the traffic will be with just that load on it. We have three different defaults and with IPS rules, the built-in ones are really important uh, because it is tough to tune an IPS policy. So would it stick with recommended? And now let's say if you're a little more paranoid, you wanna go strict, what does that mean? Uh, it means you're gonna have a lot more false positives and more than likely your traffic will also be a bit slower. And that's because one, you have a lot more rules, a lot more stuff to check. Stuff that is probably not okay on a server, but might've been okay on a phone or a computer, right? Will more than likely slow down your network a bit because usually when you have different IPS policies like this, the recommended is just gonna be the relevant threats, the ones that Checkpoint Security Intelligence has deemed to be the most common or most prevalent attacks that we're seeing at the moment or that they're seeing at the moment. Uh, so these are the ones that we need to check for. When you put it on strict, you're gonna add a lot more rules, a lot more things to check. So it's not just gonna check the most common or the most prevalent or recent attacks. You might be checking attacks that were relevant five, six years ago. So it's gonna go through a lot more processes and it's gonna slow it down. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, they even pointed out here it will have a performance impact. So yeah, all that is simple and uh, the default was great there too. So this was actually really impressive to me. Again, I've worked with a lot of different firewalls. I haven't really worked with Checkpoint much, but from an SMB standpoint, it's always been kind of a, a kind of pain point for me because it's hard for me to recommend the stuff I work with all the time since it's gonna require someone that has more knowledge in this field and or a lot more budget. And this one so far, I think most anybody that's somewhat technical savvy and even on the not so technical savvy end, we'll be able to set it up because most of the defaults were good and there's wizards that work pretty well that, that would usually require a lot more configuration. I mean, I thought it was gonna take more than one video to do the entire setup of doing our initial configuration, our initial security policy and setting up the Minecraft server. And we just did that all. Really didn't even have to go too much detail of each one because it's all automated. And yes, I did say we're gonna be testing the throughput, but I will be doing that in a separate video. I'll set up a PFSense server, the other side. So for the test, I'll be setting up an iPerf server in my network and testing the throughput to that. So we'll have something more consistent than just speed test. But I will do all those in one video uh, to kind of keep it short and simple. But yeah, so far overall, I'm really impressed. I'll do a couple more videos on some other specific features and we'll definitely be expanding on security policy. The security policies alone and all the security features will be in its own video. We still got remote and site to site access VPN to set up. We still have to go through the security policies and some other features that are just completely new to me, like having the mobile application to go along with this. So still planning to go on this firewall. Uh, let me know what you want to see on here. I hope you enjoyed. Thanks again to Checkpoint for sending out the firewall. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out all my links in the description below. I'm still trying to upload a bit more regularly, but there's a lot of stuff in my life changing right now. So um, I'll take it as it comes. Good stuff though, hopefully. All things go well though, great changes. Yeah, anyway, hope that helps. Thanks.